Um, thank you, Betty. Uh, thank you, Heartland Institute, for putting this wonderful conference together. Uh, my name is Kevin Dyer-Rotna. I'm the senior statistician and research programmer at the Heritage Foundation Center for Data Analysis. And I'm going to talk about a cost-benefit analysis of the Green New Deal. So firstly, let's talk about energy in and of itself. Energy is literally the fundamental building block of civilization. From enabling you to light up your home, to enabling you to drive your cars, to enabling this very conference to operate, energy has literally become the basis of anything and everything we do. There's a wonderful book by Alex Epstein, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, that really goes, speaks volumes about the usefulness and the importance of energy. And unfortunately, many people, particularly lawmakers, take the concept of energy for granted. So what have we heard over the years? We've heard that the climate is changing. We've heard that CO2 and other greenhouse gases contribute significantly to this change. And we've heard that action must be taken. So what so-called solutions have been proposed? Uh, cap and trade uh, you know, has been popular in the past. The late Senator John McCain and his colleague Joe Lieberman suggested something along these lines about 20 years ago. Uh, more recently, Waxman and Markey suggested a cap and trade bill uh, around 2009. Uh, subsequently, uh, the Obama administration issued the Clean Power Plan, a directive to limit CO2 emissions. Um, even more recently, there was a Paris Agreement, which President Trump recently pulled us out of. And most recently, there has been the Green New Deal. So before we get into the Green New Deal, I want to talk about a more general construct. What are all of these policies, including the, new green, the green New Deal, predicated on? The answer is the social cost of carbon. I've spoken about this at length in other conferences, including this one about two years ago, congressional testimony. I've published in the, at the Heritage Foundation as well as in the peer-reviewed literature. Our papers are back there. If you guys are welcome to pick up copies on your way out. I don't want to go too much into the details, but it is worth talking about. So the social cost of carbon, AKA the SCC, is a class of models proposed as the basis for regulatory policy by the previous administration and is defined as the economic damages per metric ton of carbon dioxide emissions. So in terms of estimating the SEC, the general question becomes, what is the long-term economic impact of CO2 emissions across a time horizon? And there are three main statistical models for getting at this question, which, uh, two of which we've adapted at the Heritage Foundation Center for Data Analysis, the DICE model and the FUN model. The PAGE model, uh, we did not adapt because the author insisted on co-authorship for anything we published, so we did not bother to adapt it. So before we go into the details about the SEC, I want to talk about a general question. With, you know, with a construct such as carbon dioxide emissions, their costs and benefits. Well, two of these three models, the DICE model and the PAGE model, a priori only assume costs. They're completely disingenuous because they don't incorporate benefits at all. The FUN model begins to incorporate benefits, but the assumptions are a bit outdated. Here is an image from a recently published study in the journal Nature, Zoo et al. 2016. Uh, this is garnered from satellite data. The shades are observed a leaf area index, average observed leaf area index. The dots are areas that are statistically significant. Between 1982 and 2009, the image makes it apparent the planet is greening. Uh, particularly if you look at the deserts, they, those are the areas that are benefiting the most from CO2 emissions if you look at it right here. The planet is greening and it is fundamentally important that any of these models take into account the benefits of CO2 emissions if they're also going to consider the costs. A massive survey, thank you, a massive survey of the agricultural literature by Dr. Craig Idso showed that between 1961 and 2011, there was a $3.2 trillion increase in agricultural output as a result of increased plant photosynthesis due to CO2 emissions. Now, moreover, again, I don't want to go too much in the detail, but this is worth glossing over. As with any statistical model, these IAMs, beyond the fact that they don't properly account for benefits, are grounded on assumptions. A few of these assumptions we looked at in our research at the Heritage Foundation Center for Data Analysis. I spoke about this uh, in congressional testimony in Capitol Hill a couple of times. They're based on assumptions, namely the specification of a discount rate, the specification of a time horizon, and the specification of what we call an equilibrium climate sensitivity distribution. Now, 
we played with these assumptions. Again, our research is in the back, run, running two of these three models in-house at Heritage. And we notice under very reasonable changes to the assumptions, the SEC can drop by between 40 and 200 percent. And under very reasonable assumptions, the fund model, which actually takes into account benefits, can be negative, which means that CO2 is a net positive externality. And the po policy implication there is that one shouldn't be taxing CO2 emissions, but should be subsidizing it instead. <laughs> now, I, of course, don't take the position that you should tax or subsidize CO2 emissions, but the sheer fact that these models can be manipulated to get any result you want speaks volumes to their uselessness in regulatory policy and the danger of putting them in the hands of policymakers. Now, I'm going to show you a chart from one of our, uh, one of our recent papers uh, regarding the, uh, the social cost of carbon. Uh, <clears throat> these models are estimated by what we call Monte Carlo iteration. The idea is, is that various components of the model are random, so they are repeatedly estimated so we can get distributional properties of the SCC. In particular, we estimate over typically 10,000 MC uh, Monte Carlo iterations. Here's a scatter plot. So the different colors are due to the different economic growth scenarios that this model uses. And the x-axis is the Monte Carlo iteration. The y-axis is the SCC. So you notice that the SEC, in some iterations, can be as high as 150 under these assumptions. By the way, this is updated in accordance with the equilibrium climate sensitivity assumption uh, distribution, excuse me, suggested by our good friend Dr. John Christie and one of his colleagues uh, in increasing the agricultural component in a perfectly reasonable way. But when you look at this, you could see that the SEC can be as high as $150 in, in some iterations, but as low as minus $100. These results are literally all over the map. So then the question becomes, what exactly is the SEC? Well, who knows, but the bottom line is policymakers can, and they have in the past, rig these models to beef up the results, to beef up what the so-called damages are associated with CO2 emissions, which enables them to justify regulatory policies such as the Green New Deal. So what exactly is the Green New Deal? The goal is to derive 100% of America's electricity from clean, renewable, and zero emission energy sources, eliminate GHGs from pretty much every sector, spend massively on clean and renewable energy manufacturing, and maximize energy efficiency. So how can we actually model the economic impact of the Green New Deal? You know, this is very challenging because Although they state what their goals are, they don't really have any meaningful steps to achieve these goals. And we, at Her the Heritage Foundation, we have the Heritage Energy Model, which is a derivative of the Department of Energy's National Energy Modeling System. This is a, essentially a government model that we've adapted in-house. So in order to achieve these reductions, you know, there are a few things you could do. You can, of course, implement a carbon tax. You can impose regulations. You can code in regulations by discouraging the use of certain you know, products and imposing mandates on renewables in terms of, you know, um, the types of renewables that contribute to generation. So we did this at the Heritage Foundation, and we did the best we could to, again, get to having 100% clean, renewable, and zero emission energy sources and eliminating all GHGs. The problem is any reasonable model is grounded in reality, and the researchers at the EIA, when they developed this model, did that the best that they could. And here's an abatement curve. By the way, my wonderful interns have passed out this paper, um, the cost-benefit analysis of the Green New Deal. Uh, you're welcome to follow along. This abatement curve is incorporated into our research. And what we did was we varied the level of the carbon tax to see what kinds of emissions reductions we could get. You could see here at a $35 carbon tax, you get around a 44% emissions reduction in 2050 with respect to 2010 levels. Around a $150 carbon tax, you get about a 54% reduction. And a $300 carbon tax, you get a 58% reduction. Beyond that, the Green New Deal crashes this government model. It cannot handle emissions reductions above that. So as a result, $300 was the best that we could do to model the Green New Deal. So as you can see, the estimates I am going to present are vast underestimates of the actual impact of the policy. Overall employment. So the heritage energy model enables us to forecast the economic impact of various energy policies. We've been using it for years. 
overall employment. You see over a 20-year time horizon, up to 2040, an average employment shortfall of over 1.2 million jobs uh, th through 2040, and a peak employment shortfall of over 5.3 million jobs. How about personal income for a family? Typical family of four incurs a loss of income on average of roughly $8,000, amounting to over 160K in lost income for a family of four. That is more than enough to send several kids to college over this time horizon. How about electricity expenditures? You know, because what we're doing here is making the fundamental building block of civilization more expensive. Electricity expenditures for households typically increase by, on average, 30%. Okay, not surprising, right? So altogether, by instituting the associated regulations in our model, we found an average employment shortfall of over 1.1 million lost jobs, peak employment shortfall of over 5.3 million lost jobs, a loss of income of over 160K for a family of four, an up to 30% increase in electricity expenditures, and an aggregate $15 trillion loss in GDP. It's much larger if you take it out another decade. Now, having said all this, Oh, and by the way, let me reiterate that these are vast underestimates of the Green New Deal because, again, yeah, we could only get to 58% CO2 reductions. So, now let's take a step back because AOC herself has said, well, whatever the costs are, we must bear them to save the planet. So, what is the climate impact of the Green New Deal? Well, at the Heritage Foundation Center for Data Analysis, we also have the model for the assessment of greenhouse gas-induced climate change, magic with two Cs. And what we did was we simulated a hypothetical scenario of eliminating CO2 emissions from the United States beginning next year completely, all through the end of the century. And we, uh, we can use this model to look at the impact on the climate. So we, we, accepted a commonly, uh, we used a commonly accepted projection of greenhouse gas emissions, RCP6, uh, suggested by the IPCC, and varied climate sensitivities within their recommended ranges. As I'm sure you know, this 1.5 to 4.5 degree range is not realistic. Uh, most of the acceptable sensitivities are toward the bottom end of this range. But since this is the IPCC range, we figured it would be you know, perfectly reasonable to estimate it within this range. I'm going to show you the results on temperature mitigation. So here we go. We see a, a variety of pairs of curves here. The gray curve is the current trajectory we are on, and the blue curve is the hypothetical scenario of eliminating CO2 emissions from the country completely. And you can see that even under a 4.5 degree sensitivity, which is much, much, much larger than the Obama administration's interagency working group had assumed regarding climate sensitivity, you see less than 0.2 degrees Celsius temperature mitigation by the end of the century. Using the previous version of the magic model, magic 5.3, one would note that assuming the sensitivity, you would have less than two centimeters of sea level rise reduction. So what does this tell us? Altogether, the Green New Deal would result in significant, many people would regard them as devastating economic costs, and essentially no environmental benefit whatsoever. So, what's our advice for policymakers? We urge policymakers to oppose the Green New Deal and any type of carbon capture related policies because they will have significant economic impacts and pretty much no environmental impact whatsoever. We urge lawmakers also to employ cost benefit analysis as was done here. These are government models that we used. The, the heritage energy model is the same model that the EIA has. The magic model is available from the EPA and is, has been used by the EPA. And moreover, lawmakers have this habit to talk about climate impacts in terms of GHG emissions. And the reason is very simple. They want to hide from you what the temperature impact is. And it's important to incorporate, go a step further and take whatever they think is going to be the GHG impact and incorporate them in a climate model to look at the actual temperature impact and sea level rise impact. Now, lastly, as I alluded to at the, er at the earlier component of this talk, we urge policymakers to stop using the social cost of carbon for cost-benefit analysis, because as you can see, these results can literally be all across the map, and they can therefore be rigged by policymakers to get pretty much any result that you want. Okay. Thank you. Happy to take any questions at the end. <laughs>